one of the most common knockout points in our system. It's the most used point. And it's simply straight across the side of the neck in here, like this. With DIMAC, you don't need to know exactly, okay, technically the point would be just in there. But I don't need to, you don't need to learn that from a DIMAC, from, from a martial point of view. All I need to know is it's, it's about there. Because I know that if I strike that, I'm taking out this whole portion of the neck. You're taking out a portion that large. You're not getting a needle and throwing it in his neck to cause the DIMAC effect. So if he say, throws a <laughs> straight punch like that, for example, see there's the strike going across his neck, you see? If there is a hook punch coming, there's the punch coming straight into stomach nine. So this is the point we're going to be working with on this uh, first volume. The rough location of the point, if you just take your little finger and put it under the ear and take a line there, you can see that curve, see that big muscle there? You can see the curve and there. Sturdermustachoidal. Sturdermustachoidal <laughs> muscle, there we go. And take a line from the top of the Adam's apple roughly across in there, that's roughly where stomach nine is. But as I say, you see your knife edge is going to take out a general region across that point. So what we're going to be doing in this video is I'm going to give you some training methods to actually teach you about getting to those points, how to access them, how to strike them, striking on mitts to generate the force and power required to strike these points. In Dimmak, we always strike points with what's called Fa Jing. Fa Jing, again, same with Dim Mac, has been changed into some mythical, magical energy where I go, and he flies back across the room. This is not Fa Jing, this is a load of garbage. Fa Jing simply means that we strike the point with an explosive nature. So when we hit the point, just to demonstrate very lightly, we don't push the point. We'll demonstrate this later with the kick bag correctly. But we don't, for example, watch the difference in the reaction to Lee's body. If I strike like this, you see, he moves backwards, but there's no shock to his system. If I strike like, like that, it's a shock to his system. That's what we're talking about with Fa Jing. So rather than striking just with that kind of impact pressure, we're getting this kind of pressure going into the point. See how my whole body shakes on the end of that strike. This has a much larger effect on the DIMMAC points, whether you're talking about energy or whether you're talking about the physiological reasons behind the points. So what I'm going to get do here is I'm going to get Lee to give an explanation as my medical professional um, as to why the points do what they do and why they should be struck in the certain direction, why they should be struck in that certain way. So today we're looking at stomach nine. Take it away, Lee. No worries. <clears throat> okay, stomach nine is the carotid sinus, which is in, this, in the carotid artery at the, the exact location that Eli gave. Um, in Western medicine, we use this point <clears throat> if somebody is in a few different states of body, but particularly cardiac um, dilemma or dismay or something misfunctioning in the heart. So in the West, in, in emergency departments, if we get somebody and I put them on a cardiac monitor, and they're either showing that they're in SVT, which is supraventricular tachycardia, or they just have a very, very high heart rate for whatever reason. We'll just simply take our thumb and we'll put it against the carotid sinus and we'll start to massage it, applying a tiny amount of pressure on the way up and relieving that pressure on the way down. And this then has an effect via the vagus nerve, which runs here, um, to the cardiac inhibitory center at the front of the brain. And this tells the body that the blood pressure, because of the pressure on the upward push that I'm using on this very, very gentle massage, um, this tells the hypothalamus or the cardiac inhibitory center that the blood pressure for the overall body is way too high. So what it does is it does an emergency release or an emergency dropping of the blood pressure by slowing down the heart. You see there, when, when I was doing the actual massage, I was applying pressure on the upward stroke. And that's increasing the pressure which is going up underneath the baroreceptor, which is basically um, a little pressure gauge. Uh, the body's ways of, of reading pressure. Um, and it takes signals from both carotid arteries. Um, so when I'm pushing upwards slightly, I'm stimulating the pressure and I'm increasing the pressure on this little baroreceptor. Now this isn't like a, a thermostat gauge, which is made out of iron. This is basically made out of the same material as your veins and arteries. So it's a very, very delicate structure. So hence, a very small amount of upward pressure is causing enough of a backflow 
or, or increasing the flow um, of blood in the carotid artery, which is then telling the hypothalamus the blood pressure is too high to drop it. If we strike inwards and upwards at a 45 degree angle, due to the fragile nature of veins and arteries, we're increasing that blood supply to a degree where we'll either burst through the baroreceptor and that would just cause a straight run of blood into the brain and then the cardiac inhibitory centre will say, okay, I really need to drop the blood pressure now um, and there's a good chance that that person will die then because the body can't regulate the pressure so it causes a cardiac arrest basically. It keeps on slowing down the heart because there's an unlimited amount of blood or an un unrestricted amount of blood rushing up, up in, into the brain, up the carotid artery and the hypothalamus of the cardiac inhibitory centre will tell the heart to slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down until they go into cardiac arrest. The secondary effect that we, that we get from striking upwards at a 45 degree angle, well the angle isn't you know, specific to the degrees, it's just coming upwards into the carotid sinus, that will actually cause the vein of the artery or the baroreceptor itself to rupture and burst. So it'll either burst immediately and that will just cause massive bleeding from the carotid artery um, into the brain and into the front of the neck here, which I've seen in emergency trauma, in, in road traffic accidents and in beatings and people who've been hit with baseball bats and such like across the front of the throat. Um, and you get a massive release of blood. It's basically the whole circulating body volume will come out of the carotid um, artery in under a minute. So that's hitting it upwards at a 45 degree angle. If somebody does attend an emergency department and they have been knocked out with a strike to the front of the throat here, we'll ultrasound the carotid artery and the, bar the baroreceptor just to make sure that it's intact. We'll also then invite them back to a clinic a week or uh, two weeks later or a couple of days later, all depends on the severity of the strike, and we'll ultrasound it again. And then we'll also ultrasound it at intervals then in, in uh, venal clinics and the such like with trauma surgeons. They'll keep on ultrasounding that probably for six months to a year just to make sure that the walls of the artery aren't breaking down. And there is where the delayed death touch comes from. The myth of the delayed death, death touch isn't a myth. You simply have caused a rupturing or a herniation of the walls of the artery and over time it'll break down. Boom! If I knock Lee straight on the back of the head with my elbow, or BAM! With a palm straight on the back of the neck, he will go down. There is no doubt about that. Talk to any real fighter, show him this kind of pressure, and say, would that knock you out on the back of the neck? He'll say yes. But, if Lee goes to tackle me, I go, oh, I should hit him up! I'm already on the floor. I'll already be on the floor by the time I think about it. It has, it has to be your subconscious reaction to hit those points. So that's what we're going to be doing in the training. What we want to do is we want to do a series of attacks and defenses um, that aim at the same point. So we're getting our mind to, or rather not our mind, we're, we're using our mind to think he throws a strike, bam, I'm, I'm at the moment when I'm learning, I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking about the point, so I'm using that. But my body, every time I do it, my body is reacting and striking to that certain point. So I'm training it into my muscle memory. Now in the Taiji system, in the Bagua system, in all the internal martial arts, every strike that we do, in every form, or kata, all the forms, all the push hands, the training methods, every single thing we do relates to Dimmak. So from your first day of learning, from lesson one, you start learning about DIMAC and programming it into your subconscious. As I say, you can't just add it on the top of your fighting system and expect it to work. Try to pay more attention to the, the principles rather than the actual technique. Techniques are useless, you're never going to use a technique. A technique's only purpose is to teach you a principle of how to move, not to actually be able to do that particular technique. Okay, so the first movement that we're going to be doing is an evasive movement. He's coming in with that, that hook punch straight to the side of my head. Very common street attack, right? I'm evading it, so I'm moving out of the way like this. Now, it's probably, this is where the maximum power is, and the golden rule is never be where the maximum power is going to be. If that's the maximum power, then I want to be somewhere over here. Or, this is the maximum power, I want to be here, you see, for a different technique. So, 
in, for this particular method, I'm evading it. I'm still attacking his nag one with my knife edge here. We strike with the pisiform bone, which is this little knobbly edge of the, of the knife edge, down the arm. Not only are we striking down the arm to upset the energy further, better strike than striking up the arm, it's simply because of the way the body works. As I say, if, if going one way or the other is more adverse in terms of the strike, so let's say hypothetically, if striking up the arm was the better strike, I still wouldn't strike up the arm for this technique because it, it wouldn't make sense, you see? It wouldn't make sense to go that way and then that way. You always look at the, the method first. So the method is this, you see? So if I'm turning my body that way, that's the direction of strike. It's going to be the most effective in that particular movement. So just do that very slowly there. So see, I've evaded the strike, I've stepped out, attack down his wrist and see here comes the punch coming through. I'm attacking with a one knuckle in this case, like that, we protrude the middle knuckle with the top thumb on the top, like that, and we're punching straight into the stomach nine point there. Now as I say, it's a small area, it's a soft area, so your whole fist is going to go in, so if you miss the point slightly, you're still one of your other knuckles is going to catch it. But just to train accuracy, we try to get it with that one knuckle, bah, coming straight in into the stomach nine point, like that. Now. When you're training these points, um, with whatever points you're doing, what we want to do is, you want to execute the movement. Of course, you'd start off slowly if, you, if you're just practicing martial arts now. If you're learning this from a beginner's point of view and you haven't done that much fighting before, then I'd just, uh, just throw it up, just to, get, just to get the idea of the movement, of course. You're just learning the technique, you see. But what we want to do from, uh, from lesson one from there, do it slow, get used to the technique, then we do it faster. So I get to throw the punch, you see? But I've thrown that punch, but after I do it, now I felt the curvature of that punch, the apex of the strike was in there, again with that upward spiral into the point. But what I'm going to do is to make sure that my mind is, is going into that point, I'm going to do the shot to program it in from a beginner's point of view, do the strike, and then I'm going to put my hand on the strike, on, on, the, on the point. Because of course, we cannot strike these points for training, for the purpose of training. Strikes on the body, you can, you can hit with a bit of pressure, it's, it's okay, they're, they're not as vulnerable. But your stomach nines, your, your throat, your behind the jaw points in here, your temple shots, things like that, you don't want to hit those. Even just that kind of pressure across the temple, you're going to cause damage to the brain. So we do not want to be doing this just for the sake of learning how to fight by injuring our partners. There's no need to actually hit the points physically. This is why, of course, later on we get the pads out and start striking them to make sure you have the power uh, regarded, uh, required to get the point in. So we're going to use each individual application. We've got four applications in this case. So he throws that. Bah! See, and I just lightly press it into the point. So I can just feel, yeah, okay, that's the point I'll be using. I'd train that for a little while. So you throw it again. Bah! Okay, yeah, I'm feeling, trying to get a, a feel for where that point is. Um, okay, the second one is, oh, let's do it on this side just so the camera can yeah. get a better angle. So, oh, in the technique, we were going to the other side, as you saw when the technique's carried on, but I'll just do it this side so the camera can see. So, I'm striking again, down the neg one, like that, same body mechanics. Only this time, rather than jumping right out of the way over here and coming into the point there, we're staying a little bit, we're still evading, a little. He throws, you see, but it's a smaller evasion, it's just a weight shift evasion, because I'm coming to this side of his body now, rather than this side. And it's a knife edge strike, like that, the whole knife edge cuts through, again, right onto the stomach nine point, and it's kicking upwards. This is our base movement in a form called small sansao in our taiji training. And we swivel, see what the hand does on the end. See how it kicks? Kicks upward. And that's what we learn, that's what you learn in your first ever tai chi class. You learn from there, bam, you see? And it's kicking up. You're utilizing the dragging back of the left hand with the kicking up and thrusting forward of the right hand. And then vice versa, of course, on the other side. All of these drills, of course, you do on left and right sides. 
So that's what we're looking at there. Striking down the arm, again, affecting the knee one point, or pericardium six, just in here, just for reference, that's about four fingers back in the center of the wrist. As I say, you're not gonna hit that bang on mo most of the time, but anywhere roughly around that portion of the wrist, just grab his wrist there, that's generally where you wanna be hitting with, with this point, so not, not up here, for example. And try to get the point right there with, with that accurate point. <sighs> Cut it in. So same thing, he's gonna throw the strike. Bah! See, I'm going to feel the point. He throws it again. <laughs> feel the point. Get used to all. Feel what that curve of his neck actually feels like in that application. Okay. Next one, he's coming through with a straight punch like that. I'm simply moving, evading to the outside of it this time. I'm taking both my hands to the outside of his arm, covering the wrist with that hand just to make sure my nose doesn't get squashed. And the other hand is striking across the back of his forearm. In this case, we would actually be striking to colon 10. I'm not going to go into detail with the setup points, as I said, but just for reference, that would be a colon 10 strike coming up the arm in that case. Another uh, setup point. So, from here, I'm striking, but see it's slipping up, you see, and into the neck. This hand's going to slide up his arm and get that strike straight across the neck. Now, you might find that in some cases, you'll fit, come here and you'll think, oh, hang on, I kind of have to go like this. You see, to get the right angle, it feels a bit awkward. But no, look, just stay in that same position. Now, I can't get it, see, it feels awkward, but watch what happens when I actually do the strike. You see, if I actually push it through, his body, now there, to get my hand on the point, I have to put my hand like that. Now, anyone can tell that's not a nice structure, you see. But from that good structure, now look at the hand, I'm gonna push through, you see? Because of the strike pushing into him, it will mould, his body will actually curve around my palm. So that's what we're looking at there. Bumping up the arm in this case, like that. And set up point wise, that's the better way to strike the, the, this particular point, is sliding up the arm and straight into the stomach nine point. So, we're getting a lateral bump. Now, watch what happens with the strikes that we're doing. As I said, you'll notice, with all the strikes, they have that shock factor to them. You'll notice that when I do, say, the first one, you see that? There was no shock in that. Now watch it again. You see where my hands ended up? Each time, you'll never see my hand end on the point because it's caused shock. It's pulled back. It's the pulling back that causes the shock. Ring a bell. If you ring the bell and leave the donger on the bell, it doesn't ring. You, you suffocate the shock, the percussion. But if you ring it and pull it off, that allows the sound out. So it's the same thing. That holds the sound in, but <clears throat> that lets the sound resonate. That's the principle. Now, it doesn't have that much effect when you're just doing that, because that's just me hitting him and then pulling my hand off, you see? That's not what Fa Jing is about. Fa Jing is where we hit, but the hand is actually going forward as the waist is pulling backwards. So we're actually getting we're getting a percussive effect. The whole body is creating that recoil. I'm not just hitting him, you see, and then that's just my arm pulling back. My body, watch what the waist does. It throws out and then it actually snaps backwards. So we go, this kind of thing happening. We'll go into more detail later on with that on the back. So, same principle here. As I strike his arm here, I'm not just, see, I'm not pushing on his arm. I'm going, you see? I'm attacking his arm, I'm striking it. It will cause shock to his system. I'm attacking the arm, sliding up the arm. I'm twisting my waist always. All the power comes from your waist. So I turn my waist to the right, slightly, and then back to the left, which of course would be your follow-up strike, you see? But it's gotta be a very small strike. We don't want <clears throat> something like that, so that's too long. By the time I've done that, he will have already thrown a second punch at me. It's got to be a very small turn. So the turn to my right, just, just hold your hand there, just look at my center, the way it moves. See that? It's just a little, oh, like that. That's how much the center moves. Just a little turn, just to where you make the contact. And as soon as you've made the contact, oh, your waist bounces off. So you're actually bouncing off his arm, although it slides up because you're moving forward. It's a bounce, a ricochet. Not, you're not doing that. You're not actually sticking to his arm in this case. You're doing that, you see? and it opens up his neck and slams across that point. So as I say, do the technique and then place the palm on the strike. 
Start off slowly and then get it a bit heavier. Get that strike coming through. Get Notice how I'm evading. See, I'm evading to the side. I'm getting my body out of the way. Just do it slowly. I'm moving my body and coming in for that strike on the side. Okay, the next technique that we did from there, or the final one, is coming on this side. And of course, as I say, you do all these techniques on both sides. You can even vary them, chop and change them. I'm just giving you four techniques to work with as a basic rule. So this one, same thing, straight punch coming in, but I'm going to cover it with this hand this time. The, the guarding hand is actually parrying down the arm, because look at the way the waist is turning this time, you see? You see the natural movement. If I were to try to go up with that arm, you see that? If I try to go up, that's going to take power out of this. If I think hitting with this hand, look what the left side's doing, you see? It's naturally pulling back. So therefore, the left hand will naturally pull down his arm if I connect it to my body. So I'm taking that there with a little hooking motion of the hand. That's going to stop me getting punched on the nose like that. Then this hand's again striking into the colon points on the arm. And bam, you see? And this time we're showing the fingers like that. It's very nice to get used to using your fingers um, simply because it gives you extra reach in your, in your strikes for your first attack. As from there, then yes, a punch or a palm is going to have more power, of course. You can, you can transmit more power through a fist or a palm than through your fingertips. But you don't need that much power for these particular points or into the throat, for example, right in the pit of the neck. So that's what we're going to aim with there. The hand is spiraling over, you see? So there's that curve down the neck. You see, it's not flat, it's not straight. See the way the palm is curved. See that like that? So you're following that vagus nerve coming down into here, you see? Like that, that curve of the neck. That's where you're going to go in. One of those fingers is going to go in and hit that point accordingly. So same thing, start off slowly. Just get the feel. See how I'm sliding? This hand is yielding to the arm this time. And it gets a little bit, a little bit quicker. See? That's what we want to look at. Train it like that, train one, and then you've got to try to get those four together. So you're trying to get your body, as we demonstrated before, doing the four strikes, so you're not just focusing on one technique, you see? Because as soon as you focus on one technique, we're doing a set pattern now. Then he throws another strike, and I'll probably punch him on the chin again, you see? So that's why we've got to vary it. Um, now, as I say, this is only a basic variation. Of what I can't give you every single variation. That's up to you to make up your own mind. So I might go, okay, the first punch, bang, the second punch, bang, this is the straight punch, and the straight punch there. That's the one I've given for you now to practice if you're a beginner. If you're a, a, a seasoned martial artist, you might want to vary that. You might start with the straight punch, bang, then you might throw the hook, you see? So you've got to be able to change them up. Get a few set patterns to start with, and then as you progress through your training, make them random. Uh, in emergency trauma, we look at an effect called shearing. And that is where a shockwave of energy has gone through the body, or force has gone through the body. And wherever there's uh, a misalignment of the body, or a weakness in the body, that's where that shock will come out. So it's very, very common that I may attend a road traffic accident, uh, where people have gone in, in, into another car, or there's been a front impact of their car. Their airbags may have deployed, and they may seem okay. I take their blood pressure, and their blood pressure is dropping, dropping, their pulse is raising, raising, raising. That says to me, as, a, as an emergency medic, that this shockwave has gone through the body and it's caused one of the internal organs where there's maybe a weakness in it or it's been in the correct place for the focus of energy to, ha um, to exit. So there's been a shearing effect where the organ has moved independently from the body and has split away from its blood supply or the actual organ itself has torn. And that's one thing that I see that we're doing when we do Fa Jing is not that we just push very hard and very violently on the body, but with the bah! of Fa Jing, we're putting that shockwave into the body, and that's causing a shockwave to go in and find its weakest point of exit. I, go up, I have to be in situations where people are having psychotic episodes. Now, personally, this is why I train. I don't need to fight, but I train because of people who are having psychotic episodes or people who want to do us a lot of damage. And in a lot of those situations, I have had to use stomach nine. I've had to use vagus and accessory nerves, other points that we've actually come across, and they have worked. 
So much so, I've, I've, I've been in situations with police where people are still fighting when they've got open fractures of their legs and they drag in their legs behind them because they are so intent on doing absolute violence that the fact that they're not unconscious, they will keep fighting. And these are the situations that I personally train for and I feel that our system trains for. And there I have used the carotid sinus or stomach nine to knock people out and it has worked. Now when we're striking in self-defense, we're not going to do, you'll see people doing dim map where they'll do combination strikes, right? So they'll do like a strike here, then a strike here, then a strike here, strike here, strike, you know, da 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 da. And if this point's used in combination with this one and that one and that one, it'll cause instant knockout. There is no way in any situation you're going to use a combination strike in a real fight. Because as soon as you've done the first strike, he moves. You, you, you can't use a combination strike. So combination strikes are only there as a training method to teach you about where the points are. If you can get to those points in a series of five strikes, what we're working on with this series is just, just working with one point. We're keeping it very simple, level one kind of thing for dim Mac training. But as we go on, of course, we start combining the points. I might get a stomach nine shot, a bladder twat, and, and a throat shot. You might get several different strikes coming through. Um, so if you can train your body to subconsciously, bah, there's a nice gallbladder 24 shot. Woo, there's a nice uh, CV4 shot on the Dantian, for example. They're all lovely points. You would never, in any combination you can come up with in training will never happen in a real street fight. But it's all good accuracy training. It's training your body to subconsciously feel, to know where those points are. You won't even realize what points you've struck until you stop and look at them. But every time, maybe not every time, there's the occasional time when we punch each other in the tip because we miss. <laughs> but you know, we're all human. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 90% of the time, you're always going to subconsciously go for the most vulnerable point for the situation you're under. Let's say, for example, uh, I don't know, say Lee throws a strike here. Oh, okay, let's say I'm on the open side. I'm not going to, from this position, say it's my right hand coming in for the strike, I'm not going to go for a triple heat of 17, because that's around here, around behind his jaw, you see? So if, I, if I'm over here, that, that's going to be a bit, I could get it, I could come around and swing into it, but chances are he'll stop me much more effect. This is open. That's much more open right in the pit of his neck. So that's the most open point to me. However, come on this side. Now, look what's open to me now. You see? So whatever point opens itself up to you, your body will subconsciously go to because we've done these seemingly silly combination strikes. So you, you give yourself hundreds of little different ways of moving how to get to the points so that your body can get to those points under any situation. Another thing about the setup points, okay, you might say, you know, why are you wasting your time striking setup points? As I say, they do have an effect. They're not going to kill the guy. They're not going to smash him here and he's going to fall to the ground. So with our setup points, rather than just stopping his arm from hitting you like this, why not attack it? You may as well. You're not wasting anything by attacking the arm rather than just putting up a stop to the arm. You're actually, in, in, depending on what technique you're looking at, you're actually utilizing connectivity into the second strike. If I strike this punch like, like this, you see, just with a stopping kind of a block, look at what's happening to my body. Nothing. My body's not turning, you see. Now if I turn it bah, and create a strike with that arm, you see my body's turning into the strike now, look what's happening to my right shoulder. That is pushing that forward. So the harder I thrust out to block him, the harder the other hand is going to pump out into his arm. So our defensive movement connects to our attacking movement to create one circular flow of movement. Interestingly, interestingly uh, pericardium 6, which we use as a setup, which I don't think we're going to cover setup points in this series, uh, pericardium 6, a lot of people think, oh, pericardium 6, it, it's related to the muscle. It's not a sac, it's muscle, uh, which acts like a sac around the heart, which again maintains it to thoracic pressure. Now, people say, oh, that's just an acupuncture point. Even if 
the acupuncture, you don't believe that the acupuncture point is going to work, which I've actually seen a doctor using this in coordination with the, um, a carotid sinus massage to make the massage more effective. And he was a Western doctor, he had no idea why he was using this. This is very, very close to the brachial nerve and the ulnar nerve. So even if the DIMAC point or the acupuncture point isn't having the effect that it does actually have around on the sac of the heart uh, or around the, on, on the muscle that's around the heart which is causing the muscle to release or to contract so increasing or decreasing the pressure on the heart it has a secondary effect on the nerves in the forearm those nerves feed into the vagus nerve here they take a signal to the cardiac inhibitory center at the front of the brain they have a second that the, the secondary effect on the heart works on a physiological point as well as on the acupuncture point. Okay, just a little demonstration of each strike that we're working with with these ones. As I say, we want to create shock in the body. So we don't, you see, damn, it's cold today. <laughs> Training out here in the back shed, it's freezing. <laughs> um, okay, so we don't want to, as I say, we don't want to push the bag. We want to try to shock the system. So with this particular strike here, we're looking at that, like that, you see? A slightly upward angled, curvy body out, but it is ideal, primarily a straight attack. It's not a curving punch like this, you see? When I attack his arm, you see, I'm evading. It might seem curvature, but see, the actual firing of the arm is actually a straight line for this first punch. So, I'm not teaching Fa Jing on this set, set of uh, lessons, by the way. I will give little uh, notions to it, but I'm not going to actually teach you Fa Jing. That would take a whole other series of videos. The primary thing we're teaching here is the Dim Mac. Keep in mind that if you learn Fa Jing, that will increase your Dim Mac ability tenfold, because that is the way that Dim Mac points should be struck. All the original Dim Mac arts were Fa Jing arts as well. Okay, so we're looking at coming around here and striking the mid. The main thing we want to look at, see that? See, I'm not looking to see the mitt moved further that time, but it didn't actually cause as much shock into the mitt. You want to hit the mitt and recoil back to cause the maximum shock in the body. Notice how the waist turns. I sink my weight down into that leg because that's of course how the body moves to evade the strike anyway. So I'm sinking my weight into my right leg. I'm twisting from the waist. A little bit of a dip on that side because, of course, I'm creating an upward angle like that. So not, not too much, not like an uppercut, but there's a little compression on that side of my body. But the most important thing is that I snap the fist closed. I'm not holding tension in the arm. You see, that's, that's never going to create snap back. What we want to do is looseness in the body, in the arms, throw the strike out and snap it closed, just be, your fist will close, people often say your fist closes on contact. Your fist doesn't actually close on contact, it seems like that because it's very, very quick. But actually the fist would close just before the contact and then, and then open. It's only on the strike, where there's any kind of tension on the end of the strike, and then it's loose, ready for the next strike of course. So that's what we're looking at with that first one. Move to the side and that's what we want. Okay, the next one we're looking at is the chop, the knife edge chop across the neck. So, same thing. What we're going to be doing this time is that one. Cutting it out. Hitting with that knife edge there. Same principle. You're going to turn your body from the waist. Sink your weight into that side, that right leg this time. Strike it out. So, that's what we're looking at there. Same principle as before. You see? It's that shock. Like that. And I'm trying to get that upward kick on the back. So it's coming through there and kicking slightly upward, just on the end of the strike. So it's not up like this. When I'm striking to stomach nine, I'm not actually striking up like that. I'm, it seems like you're striking forward, but just on the end, you see, the wrist kicks on the end of the movement. So there's coming straight, you see, but as it kicks in, uh, that's the upwardness on the end of the strike. So again, as I'm coming in there, I'm trying to concentrate the pressure down on this part of the hand now. Starting from there, that's what we're looking at. Make sure with this one particularly, all your strikes, but this one particularly, make sure you're not doing this. You see? Now it's hard. Let's see where the power's going. It's, the power's actually missing the mitt. You must try to get the power to go through the mitt each time that you do the strike. 
So, you see? Try if you can to get it from a fairly close range, so you're not swinging your arm into the technique. Bring it just at least from a good sort of boxing range like this. Not, not off your back hand like that. Try to bring it at least from your front hand, like your jabbing hand if you like. Like that. You see? This time we're coming across the mitt, you see? It's, it's the same strike as that one we've just done, only that one's sort of coming a bit more across your body, sort of. Whereas this one, you see, it's coming a bit more out from your body. It's just a slightly different angle to the strike. But the actual impact is the same. What you're doing with your hand is the same. It's just the angle of the strike that is slightly different. So you're starting there and you're crossing it across. But say the same thing. I don't want to miss like this and hit him in the face. If you're hitting, see, it's going forward. That means my power's going this way. I want my power to go in to the, to the striking object. So this is what I want. Like that. Notice how I'm still pumping the waist out, pushing the waist to the right, and then it snaps back to the left. When you're doing your dim mat training, notice how I'm looking here, I'm not looking at the mid. That indicates if you look first, that means you've thought about hitting it before you hit it. You must hit it without looking, without thinking. So take your gaze with all the strikes, and when you're doing it with your partner, maybe not the first go, because you might punch your partner in the neck, get used to it first and then start looking just over their shoulder. This one's a bit difficult to practice with a very hard mitt like this. This is, a, this is a very firm sort of a mitt. You really need something quite squashy to practice it to get a real effect because of course your fingers, see they're going to squash in into the neck. Whereas with the, with the mitt, depending on how you hit it, you, you, you've just got to condition them up. But basically the one rule with the finger strikes, even though we're striking to a very soft area, never go like this, never straighten your fingers. Because if you miss and hit him in the chest or in the head or wherever, you're going to percuss your fingers, you're going to break your fingers like that. So bend your fingers, you see, every time we hit with the fingers, see how there's a curvature to that hand like that. So if they go in and I do hit something hard, you see they'll just bend, they'll just bend backwards. So that's what we're looking at now. Now with reference to striking on the bag with this, you're not going to, as I say, you're not going to channel as much force, you're not going to see that so much shot going into the body because I'm only transmitting through the fingers. But the fingers are much more pinpointed. They're very small bits going in, so you don't need as much power as we hit it. So we're coming from there and coming across like that, you see? So I'm not thinking straight, I'm gonna hurt my fingers, especially on a hard mitt. Take it across. When you first start training, try to get a softer mitt um, to, to practice with. So we're getting, you see that? That's what I'm getting. So it's still a straight line attack. I'm not sweeping it or gouging it, something like this. It's coming straight into the point. But, see that? Just, just hold a bit of tension yeah. so I can bend my fingers. See, that will happen. Now keep in mind that shouldn't happen because the thing you're hitting is soft. So if you now release that, that tension, when I push in, you see the mitt will move rather than my fingers bending. So if I hit him on the chest, uh, my fingers will bend naturally. But if I hit him on the neck, which is soft, uh, you see the fingers will go in rather than my fingers bending. So it, it, it's a natural motion by holding that curvature. You don't have to think, hold them tight or bend them. You don't have to think about it. It's naturally designed into the technique. So that's what we want. Now, particularly with the finger strikes, we don't want to push through because that's where, if you get it wrong, you can hurt your hand. So with this, even if you get it wrong, you're only penetrating a very small amount, so it's going to cause you minor damage if you do get it wrong, rather than trying to thrust through the object like that. So same thing, you're evading it this time, just like before. Remember, the punch is going over your left shoulder, taking it back and sticking your fingers in there. Try to get the angle right, um, so you're spiraling it over just a little bit, like that, you see? So we're getting... <laughs> I'm just, I'm feeling all four fingertips there. Touch the bag like that and twist a little bit onto the bag as I hit it. 